algorithms. Uh, just a word of reassurance, Alex is still uh, the lecturer in charge. Uh, he's in China right now, and he's requested me to take care of two lectures this week. Uh, uh, especially, I'll be covering dynamic programming today, as well as for the lecture tomorrow. So, as planned, uh, the plan of this uh, lecture is going to be to cover dynamic programming, and this is one of the coolest things you can learn in algorithm design. Uh, it's one of the tools which is very helpful in problem solving. Uh, for many problems which may seem intractable, dynamic programming is a very useful and practical approach to solving problems efficiently and practically. So uh, in the course of this lecture, uh, I'm going to go over several case studies where we will take an example of a dynamic programming problem and we will see how dynamic programming is applied to solve this problem. So just to clarify, uh, this is one week where Alex is not taking the course, but he'll be back next week. So my name is Harris Aziz. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in the computer science department, and I'll be taking these uh, two classes today and tomorrow. So let's just jump in. So the idea of dynamic programming is that you dynamically build solutions of sub-problems and use those solutions of sub-problems to solve larger problems. So as mentioned in the slide, the idea of dynamic programming is to build an optimal solution to the problem from optimal solution for carefully chosen sub-problems. So this is the most basic definition of dynamic programming. The idea is that you need to choose carefully chosen sub-problems and try to solve those problems in order to solve larger problems. Generally, you can use uh, recursion to solve several problems, but the issue with recursion is that several times you may have to solve too many sub-problems. So our goal in dynamic programming is going to be to choose only a polynomial number of sub-problems in order to solve your main optimization problem. So that is going to be our goal. And instead of talking abstractly, it'll be best if we jump into some examples. So just to recap, sub-problems are chosen in a way so that they allow for the recursive construction of sub-optimal problems to problems from optimal solutions to smaller size problems. So this is going to be one of the main ideas in dynamic programming. And the, the main idea of the efficiency of dynamic programming is that you find the sub of set problems to solve the larger problems, and these solutions of sub-problems have a huge overlap. So often it's the case that you solve a small sub-problem, and the solution of a slightly larger sub-problem is just a modification or an extension of the solution of the smaller sub-problem. So that is the heart of dynamic programming, that you want to find uh, some recursive formulation so that whenever you are able to solve smaller sub-problems, you can simply extend the solution of those smaller sub-problems to find a solution of the larger problem. And uh, each problem is solved only once, and its solution is stored in a table, and this solution can be used multiple times uh, when it's used in an extension of the larger subproblem. So these are the main ideas involved in dynamic programming, and probably it's best to already jump into an example which exemplifies how dynamic programming is solved. So the problem instance in this case is a uh, problem where you have a list of activities listed from A1, A2 to AN. So each activity is denoted by AI for I from 1 to N. And each activity AI has a corresponding starting time SI and it has a finishing time FI. So this activity can only be done when its starting time is SI and its finishing time is FI. It cannot be done earlier than SI, it cannot be done later than FI. So another assumption of this problem is that no two activities should be uh, scheduled so that they overlap. You can't have a case where you're, you're doing one activity and there's an act another activity whose time uh, range overlaps with the activity you're doing. So we need to choose a set of activities and we have to choose a non-overlapping set of activities or a disjoint set of activities. So what is the problem? 
given a set of activities with corresponding starting times and corresponding finishing times, we want to find a subset of compatible activities with the maximal duration. So note again that by compatible I mean that no two schedule activities should overlap. So if we were to solve a slightly different problem, say we don't want to maximize the total duration of activity schedule, but simply the total number of activity schedule, how would you solve that? Yeah, so it's the most basic uh, greedy approach, which you've already covered before your midterms, and it's using a greedy approach where you find an activity which has the earliest finish time, you schedule it, then you find another uh, compatible uh, activity which has the earliest finish time, you schedule it next, and you continue until you've run out of activities. So this is fine for solving uh, the problem of maximizing the total number of compatible activities, but this greedy approach is not okay when you wa want to find the maximal duration. So you want to schedule activities so that you uh, schedule activities for the maximal duration. In order to solve this particular problem, uh, we uh, rely on dynamic programming. And the idea of dynamic programming here is that we set it up in a suitable way so that in order to find the main problem, we need to find subproblems. So we need to have some recursive formulation for this. In order to do it in a convenient way, for this particular problem, we first order the activities in uh, a particular manner. So the way we uh, schedule the activities is as follows. We say that we assume that activities are scheduled in a, uh, are n named in a way so that it's a non-decreasing sequence such that F1 is less than or equal to F2 is less than or equal to Fn. So in case the activities are not ordered in this way, we can simply rename them so that it's, we ensure that the first activity has the earliest finish time, the second activity has the second earliest finish time, and the nth activity has the uh, latest uh, finishing time. So once we've done this, we are ready to solve this by dynamic programming. And how do we do that? In order to solve it by dynamic programming, we need to set up some sub-problem which is general enough to solve our general problem. So the sub-problem in this case is PI. And we will formulate sub-problem PI in such a way so that when we solve PN, we have solved our main problem. So for every i less than or equal to n, where n is the number of activities, we solve the following subproblems. So the, what is the definition of the subproblem? It's pi is find a subsequence sigma i of the sequence of activities from a1 to a i. So note here that when we solve pi, we only restrict our attention to activities which are from a1 to a i. And while restricting our attention to these activities from A1 to AI, we want to find a subsequence of these activities which are compatible, which means that they do not overlap, and they satisfy certain structural properties. So the first property that we require is the sigma I consists of non-overlapping activities, as mentioned earlier, same as compatible activities. Secondly, uh, we Suppose that for this particular pi, when we find the sigma i, this sigma i ends with activity ai. So this is going to become clearer why we do so, because this will really help to keep track of uh, the solutions which we find for subproblems. And finally, this particular sequence, sigma i that we find, is of maximal total duration among all subsequences of si which satisfy condition one and two. So note here that if we solve Pn, what will that correspond to? Um, not exactly, but it will correspond to including all a subsequence of maximal duration which includes all activities, but with, its, with the condition that it ends with activity a n, right? So in order to find the overall solution, all we have to do is we need to find p1, p2, p3, p4, and we continue until we find p n. 
among all these solutions, all we need to find is one which has the maximal duration, right? So PN is not the exact answer, it's almost the right answer, it's because for PN, we will have this condition that it ends with activity AN. And maybe it's the case that the global optimal solution does not end with activity AN, right? So, when you say that it ends with activity AI, A, A, it means that activity AI is in the subsequence, right? So yes. Include it. Okay. Yeah. So this is an additional condition which we are putting, and it's a, there's a reason for that which will become clear in the next slide. But firstly, before I proceed, is the problem clear? And the way we set up the sub-problem, is that clear? So this is a very general, uh, this is one particular problem, but the approach is very general. Often what you have is a case where you have a problem, you want to set it up in a way so that you define a very restricted sub-problem, and the idea is that if you solve many of these sub-problems, a polynomial number of these sub-problems, solving those number of sub-problems is enough to find the global solution. In this case, all we need to do is we need to solve P1, P2, P3, P4, and so on. And the nice thing about this way I've set it up is that in order to solve P1, or in order to solve P2, we just need to find some information of P1 and modify it a bit. In order to find P3, we just need to modify the solution for P1 or P2 and find that for P3. And we keep on storing these information and then we use them to solve a larger problem. So let's um, proceed. As mentioned earlier, the role of condition two is simply to simplify the recursion. So let's say that Ti is the total duration of the optimal solution sigma i of the subproblem Pi. Note here that Pi is the optimal solution when restricting yourself to activities from A1 to Ai. So what we do is we dynamically solve very small problems and use those problems to solve larger problems. So let's solve T1. T1 is going to be solved by only restricting our attention to what? Only the first activity. And for, if we just restrict ourselves to one activity, in particular A1, then you know what the duration of that activity is going to be. It's simply going to be F1 minus S1. So that's the simplest base case we have solved, and we will use the solution of this base case to solve larger and larger problems. So the best way to think about this is uh, graphically, we have the case where, for example, the K minus one activity starting time is here, the finishing time is here, here the K minus two activity is here, the finishing time is somewhere else, and we use this kind of figure to understand what's going on. So the recursion is going to be very simple. The recursion is going to be based on the fact that assume that we have solved all subproblems for all j less than i. So note that we want to solve pi, the problem with respect to parameter i. In order to solve pi, we will use the information which we've already stored for solving all the problems pj, where j is less than i. So Suppose that we've already solved pj for all j less than i. In that case, and we have stored them in a table. In that case, ti can be easily solved as well. And how do we solve ti? Well, ti is simply going to be, you, what we do is we look at all j less than i, and we restrict our attention to all those j's where f of j is less than si. Note here that J is going to be the last scheduled activity uh, in that subsequence. Since J is the last scheduled activity in that subsequence, you do not really need to worry about other activities before J, AJ. All we need to do is we want to make sure that we need to make sure whether we are uh, scheduling AI or not. So in order to schedule AI, we need to make sure that the previous activities finishing time, fj, is less than the starting time of si. So we restrict our attention to those j's. And for those j's, we know that if we have solved uh, tj for j less than i and fj less than si, 
then all we need to do is if we add a i to the schedule activity in addition to the activity schedule where the end last activity is a j, then the schedule time is going to be t j plus f i minus s i. So all we did was we looked at the optimal solution for t j. We checked whether j and a j and a i are compatible. If they are, then we can simply schedule a i in addition to the optimal solution for t j. And the time for that is going to be t j plus f i minus s i. Of course, uh, we don't know which j to look at, but we could look at all possible j's. So we could look at j equal to 1, 2, 3, and on until i minus 1. So we, we could look at all of those. It's just a linear number of uh, j's to consider. And for each of those j's, we can look at whether there's this compatibility. And after that, we can find all these times, and we can just find the maximum time. So we, we just identify the j whose solution gives us the maximum time when we add AI in extension to all the j's. All right? So this is the way we set up the problem. Um, we find a recursive formulation for the problem, and we ensure that in order that dynamic programming is successful, we solve all, given that all, we have solved all the sub-problems, we can use the solutions of the sub-problems and use those to find uh, the solution for PJ, a PI. And the, the optimal time for uh, the solution for uh, PI is going to be TI. So all we're doing is we're keeping track of sub-problem solutions and using that to find uh, solutions for bigger I's. Any questions up till now? So this is one of the most basic dynamic programming examples. So if, if this is clear, it will be easy for us to proceed further. Yeah? Um, so if you're trying to, if for every ti, you have to calculate um, tj up to i, right? Yes. And then you have to calculate every single ti. Every possible ti? Yeah. Well, you just take the maximum of all possible uh, achievable uh, schedules. So, so you look at all the j's less than i. For each of those, you see if you additionally added uh, a i in addition to the solution of uh, p j, if you get a, a, you get a co corresponding time. You compare the corresponding time for all the j's, and what is whatever is the maximum is is the one you're going to take. If you wanted to calculate all the TIs, well, in order to calculate TIs, all we have to do is restrict yourself to a uh, linear number of Js. OK? So of course, each of those may take linear time, so overall it's quadratic time. But in order to solve TI, you just need to look at linear number of uh, TJs. Yeah, oh, that was my question. I'm still taking quadratic time basis. Yeah. So in this table, since we don't just want to find the time for the optimal solution, we actually want to find the schedule, uh, we will also look at, um, besides ti, we will also store the j for which the max was achieved. So for example, for this ti, we identify all these j's, and for we note that j, which helped us achieve the maximum time for ti, and we store that j as well. So by doing that, what we know is we can find the suitable previous optimal task, which gave us that e extension. And by doing that, we can read off the solution and not just find the maximum durable time. So, yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to know like, how we know that AI is in the optimal solution, if that makes sense. Because yeah. we're fixing that point. Yeah. So, OK, that's a very good question, and that's exactly what was helping us here. So the prob sub problem PI is the one which ends with activity AI. So we, we, fixed we, we fixed it. For our own help, we just made sure that we are imposing this condition that AI has already been scheduled. Okay. By doing that, we don't care about the previous activities because we are just concerned about the starting and finishing time 
of A, I, and A, J, and yeah. we're done. There was that one, yeah. yeah. then you might uh, be in trouble. So the idea of dynamic programming is that you want to have as much structure as possible. You do not want to, firstly, you do not want to solve exponential number of sub-problems. So if you're not going in some methodical way, uh, you might not be able to use a base case, then solve a sub-problem, then f solve a super-problem. So in order to do it in a methodical way, we set it up in a way so that we had activities in some order, and we could just go one by one and uh, find solutions. So it's critical here that we are using finishing times. Okay. And the reason is because we know that the finishing time of uh, fi, fj is going to be, it needs to be before the starting time of si, right? So in order to do that, we just need to look at, we just need to worry about the loss activity. So in order to deal with this compatibility issue, uh, we do not want to look at everything, so we just focus on the loss activity. We know that loss activity is scheduled for sure because that's part of how we set up a sub-problem. We do not know whether other activities have been scheduled or not, but we do know that for SI, activity AI has been scheduled. So we know what the latest finishing time of this subsequence is. And by knowing that, we can know whether we can schedule AI or not. All right? Any other questions? So the issue with divide and conquer and recursion in general is that we do not have control over how many times we need to solve the same subproblem, or in fact, how many subproblems we want to solve. So you can view dynamic programming uh, as a way to do recursion where you're solving subproblems, storing the information about the solutions of the subproblems, and using them minimal number of times to solve a larger problem. So it's you can view it as a bottom-up approach. So you solve sub-problems, and you use those to find uh, solutions to larger problems. And you keep storing all the information you have. And you don't want to reuse information again and again. So if you've already solved a sub-problem once, you can just look it up. You do not want, in recursion, it might be the case that you're calling the same problem again and again. Right? So you don't want to do that. And you certainly do not want to solve exponential number of sub-problems. Any other questions? You can certainly start with j equal to 1 because you can at least schedule one activity, right? So the issue is whether you can schedule more than one in a compatible way. So you can certainly, you do not have to restrict your attentions to j equal to 0. If you want, you can. It doesn't matter. You can set it up, but we don't need to because you can always schedule one, at least one activity. So for the base case, you can, you can just set it up to be sigma 1 is the one where you've already chosen this. So this, this already works. So I don't see why you need to change this formulation. Yeah. Yeah. So if you start with J0, then you can remove that. Sure, but this is working as well, right? <laughs> because you're restricting your attention to the first, uh, let's say you have two activities which are overlapping. First, you restrict your attention to only one activity. Uh, it doesn't, w uh, you just pick it. Uh, f when you want to include two activities, you're right, you're basically considering J equal to zero, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So it's, it's consistent with what's written here. Any other questions? All right, so this is how you set up a recursion and how you solve a sub-problem to solve a larger problem. So often in your uh, algorithm design course, you do not just want to come up with an ad hoc method and just suppose that it works. You also want to formally verify whether your algorithm is correct or not. So there are two analysis uh, issues in uh, algorithm design. You want to prove that your algorithm is doing exactly what's required. Secondly, you want to prove that the running time of the algorithm is ac according to your claim. So this is something which will come up often. It's going to be tested in your exams and assignments. So we will not just come up with a dynamic programming formulation. We, will, we might want to formally verify that our dynamic programming formulation is correct. So let's just look at this simple example and see why our approach is working here. So the question is, why does the recursion produce optimal solutions to sub-problems PI? So to, in order to argue for that, what we notice here is that we do not need to solve all kinds of strange problems with no structure in order to solve a larger problem. We can simply restrict our attention to optimal solutions of smaller problems from P1, P2, P3, P4, and so on till Pj, and use that to find a solution for Pi. So the assumption here is that in order to optimally solve Pi, you just need to optimally solve from P1 to all Pj's less than Pi. So I'm now going to argue why this is the case. So let's say we have an optimal solution uh, for subproblem Pi. Recall that optimal solution for Pi means that activity Ai is actually scheduled. So in this uh, sequence, we have these activities from AK1, AK2, AKM minus one, and AKM, which is the last activity. And note that this activity is, has to be, KM has to be I. And the reason is because by definition of a subproblem, activity AI is scheduled. So this activity is actually AI. So what we claim here is that the truncated solution, sigma prime, which does not include AI, is an optimal solution to the subproblem pkm minus 1, where km minus 1 is some integer less than i. So remember that this is exactly what we're doing in our uh, formulation and our algorithm. And now I'm claiming why, whenever you have an optimal solution for a larger problem, we have essentially solved all the optimal solutions for subproblems as well. And in, in particular, this particular sigma R, uh, prime is an optimal solution when we restrict ourselves to subproblem P of Km minus 1, where Km minus 1 is less than i. So this is what we're going to argue for. And the argument is really simple. Suppose that. Uh, you solve the subproblem suboptimally, which means that uh, you found a sequence of uh, activities which gave you a duration, but there is another sequence of activities which gives you a larger duration. And we know by the definition of P, K, M minus 1 that activity A, M minus 1 is actually scheduled. Then you can simply find a, a better schedule which ends with Km minus 1, and simply extend that solution by also adding activity Ai. Right? So simply, the idea is that if sigma i was not an optimal solution for problem P km minus 1, then you can simply replace that solution with a better solution and still have a compatible solution when we even add Ai which would mean that our original solution for PI was not optimal. So this is just a contradiction. So this shows that every time you solve PI, you have also solved optimally problems uh, P, Km minus 1, where Km minus 1 is less than I. So this gives us a lot of structure. 
And using this structure, we can solve uh, problem pi. You do that for p1 to p2, p3, and so on for pn. And after that, you simply choose that particular schedule, which gives you the maximum time. So continuing with the solutions, t max is simply the maximum of all t i's where i is less than n, and we are done. So we have found the schedule which has, or we have in fact find the time duration of the schedule which is optimal. And by doing that, you can even find the actual schedule which corresponds to this t max. And why is that? Anybody wants to respond to why we can find the optimal schedule just by looking at the table? Because every time we store it where we came from, from which exactly. So exactly, we look at the last activity which is scheduled uh, in T max, corresponding to T max. In that table, we know which was the previous activity which, which we used to extend our solution, and we simply follow this trail. And by following this trail, which is a linear table, we can find the overall schedule which corresponds to T max. All right? So this is the footprint of how you're going to solve dynamic programming problems. You set up a corresponding subproblem. You uh, solve smaller subproblems, in particular the base case. You store information. And eventually, uh, you're able to solve the overall problem. In, in order to argue for why it's correct, you may often have to say why you're optimally, you, the subproblem has to be solved optimally as well. So this is uh, how you're going to address uh, more complicated problems which will come up in these, these slides as well as your exams. So I've already given the argument why this solution is optimal, so let's carry on. And again, uh, as far as time complexity is concerned, notice that for any entry in the table, you just need to look at all entries before that entry. So it's simply a quadratic time algorithm, which was a question which was asked on this side of the audience, right? So let's look at another problem. Uh, this is very similar in nature to uh, the problem we considered before. And we'll speed up a little, but idea will be very similar. How many of you are familiar with this string problem called longest increasing subsequence? OK, so there are many problems in stringology where uh, you have to deal with strings, and you need to do all kinds of processing of strings. And this is also very helpful in uh, gene processing and often looking at uh, uh, you have these codes for genes, and you want to see how much similar they are. So there are lots of very important problems where these kind of problems are encountered. This is one of those problems which can be solved efficiently by dynamic programming. Not every problem in string matching and in string algorithms can be solved efficiently. But let's look at it. So the problem is that you're given a sequence of n real numbers. We want to find a subsequence not necessarily contiguous, which means that the numbers do not have to be uh, adjacent to each other, of maximum possible length in which the values of the subsequence are strictly increasing. So you can just imagine a string of numbers, and you want to find a substring in which each entry in the string is larger than the previous entry. So again, uh, we want to find it via dynamic programming. And again, we want to solve the larger problem, which is uh, for, all, for n, which is the length of the string. But we will solve it for i less than or equal to n and use that information to solve our problem. So I'm already giving you the, the main trick here, and which is how to define the subproblem. So this is going to be your first thing you're always going to do when you try to solve problems by dynamic programming. You want to set up the subproblem in just the right way and know that as long as you can solve all the subproblems, you have essentially found the solution. So in this case, what is a subproblem? Its subproblem is called pi with respect to input i. And it finds a subsequence of the sequence 
of all numbers of maximum length in which the values are strictly increasing and which ends with ai. So again, we are doing something very similar to the previous problem. We are imposing this addition structure where the solution ends with ai. And again, the reason why we do this is that if we know that a string ends with ai, if we want to extend the solution, all we need to do is find a number which is greater than ai. We do not really need to worry about the previous numbers. Do you mean completely the other way around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But, but then in that case, you basically, instead of going from uh, left to right, you're going from right to left. Yeah. Sure. That's almost a symmetric solution. But if you want to think in terms of choosing the first number, the, which is leftmost, which is the smallest, then the next, you may want to do it this way. But of course, it doesn't really matter. So both are symmetric solutions. Yes? Uh, P2 and P3 could have the same solution. That's not possible because we know that the solution of P2 ends with P2, uh, uh, entry 2, and the solution for P3 ends with. Uh, so we, this is simply because we're imposing this addition structure here. But in general, of course, if you're restricting yourself to, let's say, any solution which may go up till the second or may go up till the third, that might overlap. But the way we've set it up, we are imposing this structure that this one stands, ends with A2 and the one you mentioned is ending with A3. I thought of maybe a counterexample or an example, one, two, three, one, two, three. Isn't that two subsequences that are exactly the same that also fulfill this thing? So you could have two subsequences that are exactly the same. Yeah, but he's, he's talking about P2 and P3, which means that finding a solution uh, which ends with the second entry and finding a solution which ends with the third entry. So, yeah. That might, uh, th okay, so this, this is basically, you might have two solutions if you're uh, not distinguishing between the, uh, the two in the first and the two in the second one, right? But either of the two, two uh, strategies work, again. So there are a few different ways. This is not the only way to solve this problem, but uh, generally dynamic programming is going to work in this case. Any other questions? OK, so let's uh, proceed. Uh, what is useful about this subproblem is that we end with AI. We assume that we have solved all problems for J less than I. And we now look, at, look for all AM where M is less than I such that AM has to be less than AI. This is the first condition of our solution that uh, the sequence has to always increase. So the last entry in what you've already found has to be, if you extend the solution, it, the new entry has to be strictly larger than the last entry in the sub-solution. So what we do is we look at all M less than I. And among M's, we simply find the M which produces the longest increasing subsequence, and it ends with AM. And then we can simply extend uh, the solution with AI to, in order to obtain a longest increasing subsequence which ends with AI. So we have to do it for all M and just find the one which does the job for us. Of course, uh, this is not going to be the global solution. It's simply going to be the longest subsequence which ends with AI. But then again, we can simply read off all solutions which end with A1, A2, A3, and so on, and we find the one which gives us the longest subsequence. So again, uh, you might ask, why does this solution give you the optimal answer? And again, it's a very similar kind of argument that in order to solve an optimal global solution, you restrict yourself to a subproblem, and that subproblem also has to be optimal. And again, the argument is exactly the same as the one I gave for the previous problem, that if you were not solving your subproblem optimally, then you can simply use, replace 
the suboptimal solution for a subproblem by a better solution and then extend it correspondingly to get a better solution which is global. So this is uh, the argument which is a bit more expanded but the idea is very simple that you, in order to find a global solution which is optimal, you look at a, all subproblems for m less than i. You know that you solve them optimally and I've given an argument why you need to solve them optim optimally because if you don't, then you can simply improve on the solution. And by solving the subproblems optimally and by extending them appropriately, you can find uh, pi and you're done. So again, uh, just as in the previous uh, problem, we are really relying on the fact that the sequence or the solution ends with ai. We use that fact to extend our solution. And again, just like in the previous problem, the time complexity is uh, big O of n squared because all you do is you simply look at all entries before that entry. The linear number of entries and you always look at uh, all entries before that entry. And you're done. Um, now we look at another problem which is about making change. It's a very typical problem which is often comes up in mathematics and computer science. And the problem concerns uh, this scenario where you have n different types of coins. Um, you have coins which have values v1, v2, v3 to vn. And we assume that v1 is 1. So you have, let's say, dollar coins. But for others, you may have different values. Say so you may have values, coin, uh, coins of value 1, coins of value v2, then v3, and so on. And you assume that you have infinite number of coins of each denomination. So for example, for V2, you have as many coins as you need. And what is the problem? So given these coins and this information about the values of these coins, uh, we want to make change for an integer amount. And we want to make change by using the minimum number of coins. So that is the uh, optimization problem. And the idea is that given an algorithm which makes change for any integer amount, capital C, we want to do it in as few coins as possible. So again, dynamic programming comes to the rescue. Uh, the recursion is now going to be on uh, the size uh, of the target amount, which is C. Note here that C is part of the input. so C could be very large, but at least we will find a solution which is polynomial in C. In fact, it's going to be just n times C, big O of n times C. And as long as C is not too large, we can use dynamic programming to solve the problem. So the idea is again to think in terms of a table. If you want to think of a table which uh, has size capital C. You want to solve subproblems which correspond to one, two, three, and use the solution of the subproblems to find solutions for larger problems. So let's look at the base case. The base case is trivial, c equal to one. You simply use the one dollar coin and you're done. Now we assume that we have solved all subproblems for j less than i. And we want to find the optimal solution for amount i. In order to do that, what we do is we consider optimal solutions of the amount i minus vk, where k uh, is a range from 1 to n. And for every amount of the form, i minus vk. So the idea is that suppose that uh, we want to solve the optimal solution for value i. Suppose that it had some coin of value k, then if it had a coin of value k and you remove that coin from our optimal solution, then the remaining value would be i minus v k. And that particular value would be optimally solved by suitable number of coins as well. So again, we're assuming that as long as we optimally solve 
the problem for i minus vk and we have the fact that the optimal solution includes a coin of denomination vk, then all we need to do is we need to remove uh, that coin corresponding to value k, vk and then solve for the smaller amount. Of course, we don't know whether we actually use uh, the coin of type vk or not. So we do not make any assumption like that. We simply consider all possible k's less than i. In fact, all possible k's, not uh, all possible k's less than i. In fact, all possible k's from 1 to n. We don't know which coin has been used. We just assume we go over all these k's and find the value i minus vk. And then we just find the optimal solution for i minus vk and use that to build up our solution. So we will simply iterate over all k's and use that to find the optimal solution. And then we know we've just added one more coin. So by doing that, we can find the optimal solution for i by solving for subproblems which are less than the value of i. So again, among all those optimal solutions which we find in the table, we pick one which uses the pos fewest possible number of coins. So say this optimal solution is opt i minus vm for m which is between 1 to n, then we can simply obtain the optimal solution opt i by adding to this particular solution one coin of denomination Vm. And that's it. So given that we have solved smaller problems, we can simply use those solutions to solving our larger problem. So we can continue until we solve the problem for uh, the largest possible value, which is C. So again, the, one may wonder why does this give you an optimal solution for i minus i less than equal to c. And again, the argument is exactly the same, that had you not solved a subproblem optimally, then that would have meant that you can simply replace that subproblem solution by a more optimal solution, and then extend it just the way we did, and have a better solution, which would contradict our, the fact that we are assuming that we have found the optimal solution. So this is a meta argument which is coming up again and again, that in order to solve a global solution optimally, you need to solve subproblems optimally. And if had you not solved the subproblems optimally, that means that you're not getting the global solution optimal as well. So that's the general idea. It's very simple. So it's referred to as a cut and paste argument because you're just using the same argument again and again for smaller problems. So how do we find the actual solution? Because we are simply finding the optimal number of coins used for each particular target value. Well, if you want to find the optimal, value, uh, optimal solution instead of just the optimal uh, value of the solution, all you have to do is you need to look at uh, C. You know which value of K, uh, which value of M gave you the corresponding solution for C. You simply remove a coin of denomination Vm to get a different value, which is i minus Vm, and you just continue in that case. So you can, in our table, we are simply finding the minimum number of coins used to find a target value. But just by looking at that table, we can even find the actual set of coins which we need to find the solution. Is that clear? They're not as many hands as for the previous examples, so I'm a bit concerned now. So it's, it's a very sim uh, similar uh, recursion. The only thing here is that instead of uh, finding a value, we do not just restrict our attentions to i or m's which are less than that value. We look at all possible values. But always we are looking at linear number of uh, table entries. So big O is on the next slide. Main, main, uh, main thing to note here is that we are filling a table of C different values. And when you're uh, going, you're filling a table, you may have to look at some of the denominations. So the overall value is uh, n times C. But the dominating thing here is this value C, because n is just linear in the input. 
C could be really large because this algorithm is not really a polynomial time algorithm because C is part of the input and C could be uh, represented by log of C bits. So if C could be really large, which could still be captured by this algorithm. So in effect, this algorithm is what you call a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. And by pseudo polynomial time, I mean that it is poly pseudo polynomial means that as long as one parameter, say C, is constant, <coughs> then the overall running time is polynomial, but overall this running time is not polynomial <coughs> because C is not necessarily polynomial in the size of the input. Is that clear? No? So the issue is that C could be really large. Uh, you can represent, because you're just representing an integer by using log C bits, you can represent a huge integer and if it's a huge integer, you're actually having to make that table of a very long length, and that might take a long time. So it's actually, if C is exponential in N, then the table is also exponential in N. And that's why I'm saying why it's not polynomial time. I had another hand somewhere. Okay, good. So again, it's dynamic programming, it's helpful. Uh, it's not giving us a polynomial time algorithm, but at least as long as C is not too large, you can uh, solve it uh, efficiently. So it's dependent on whether C is large or not. So generally, you can't solve it. Uh, if C is large, you can't just solve it in polynomial time. OK, uh, the next problem is um, a problem which is um, often used in knapsack problems. It's encountered in many different scenarios. So just a quick question. Uh, do you guys uh, uh, have a break after an hour? Usually. Usually? Yeah. OK, so let's meet at, say, 5 past 1. Is that fine? <laughs>